So um, we'll take your questions about the film afterwards at the reception, and now Greg Lay is going to present his vision for the Lightning Foundry, which is his next project. Hello, all. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's my first time in the museum. It's, it's an amazing place. Some really well-kept and very unique large machines out there. Um, this is a, a 112 scale model of what I call the Lightning Foundry. It's a twin coil system. And uh, these 112 scale models are um, each about uh, 10 feet tall. And the full scale system needs to be about 12 stories for each tower in order to try to recreate some unique high energy effects that are only seen in natural lightning. The uh, primary uh, motivation for building them is to try to get at some of these effects that drive lightning and give lightning its unique ability to kind of cheat how we understand electrical discharges. In a typical laboratory, it takes about two to three million volts per meter of length to produce electrical discharge. However, uh, lightning is somehow to able to get away with operating at maybe a tenth to one twentieth of that. And we still don't fully understand how that happens. Um, we do know now, in say in the last five years or so, that these odd effects start to produce themselves once the arc extends beyond about 60 to 80 meters in length. And so the interesting question is, can we build a machine big enough to reproduce uh, lightning effects at this scale. And if we can, um, such a machine uh, could potentially produce some very interesting discoveries. Is it possible to build a machine that big? Um, I think it is. And uh, Electrum was a really great uh, stepping stone towards seeing if engineering laws, as we understand them, might scale up to this point. I threw in here a little uh, video of uh, some a lightning discharge taken by uh, Tom Warner at 7,200 frames per second. Uh, lightning uh, does some very interesting things if you slow it down. Before, you, before the actual strike hits the ground, there's literally dozens of leaders that shoot every which way, and some of them don't make any sense. Uh, they're even going back up to the cloud, uh, which I, I can't understand how they would do that. But um, if you look very closely at, uh, let's see if I can make the cursor show up. There it is. Well, I don't understand how PowerPoint works, apparently. <laughs> but you can, uh, you can see at the uh, head of those streamers, there was a little bright section that seemed to propagate along and do all the work of advancing the lightning. And uh, what goes on in that little head is, uh, is potentially very interesting. And it's also some tens of meters in length. And that's the part that we'd like to be able to kind of recreate on demand in the presence of instruments that would help, help us to see what's going on inside it. Um, in the past, uh, there's been some large and unusual machines, in particular this one, which was built in near, uh, in near Novosibirsk in the late 60s. Uh, the Russians were studying how to send uh, cheap hydroelectric power from Siberia to Moscow on very high voltage lines. And this machine here generates a 5 million volt pulse. The interesting thing about this photo is normally this machine should only arc about 10 meters or so. They certainly didn't expect it to arc any further than this. But under just the right conditions, this thing would haul off and shoot arcs hundreds of meters long. And at 5 megavolts, it's well in the regime of uh, the electric fields and distances that you need to maybe produce some of these effects that uh, drives lightning. At the time, they had no explanation for this and just kind of chalked it up as a curious effect and also one that kind of damned their 
uh, plans to produce uh, multi-megavolt transmission lines. This is the elevation view of what I'd like to build. It's essentially two machines 10 stories high, and between them would be a sufficient electric field and length to, at least according to theory, uh, produce some of the relativistic effects that we think drive lightning, and that we now have some evidence uh, that they do. Uh, there was a gamma ray observatory that went up in the, in, in the 2000s, and uh, it was supposed to do a gamma ray survey of the cosmos. However, they were getting uh, interference from somewhere and finally turned the thing around and did a survey of the Earth and found that uh, the tops of thunderstorms were producing these wonderful gamma ray bursts. Under classical theory, you wouldn't expect gamma rays from a lightning storm, but if there are relativistic effects occurring in the lightning, then you would expect gamma rays. And uh, hopefully Sunday we'll get to build this and uh, look for gamma rays and figure out how lightning works. Um, the project right now is unfunded. Um, I'm kind of surprised nobody wants to fund it, but then again, I'm biased on this. <laughs> uh, I'm also a rather poor salesman of things like this, but uh, we're pers pursuing it anyway, and uh, we're just going out onto gray markets and finding obtainium in the weirdest places. There's a two megavolt, or I'm sorry, two megawatt transformer sitting on a rail car in Kansas, and uh, it's an old military transformer. I'm trying to figure out how to get it to San Francisco, but uh, hopefully someday we'll have this together and uh, perhaps find some interesting discoveries. Thank you. in Alberta, I'd like to uh, thank you both for that uh, uh, wonderful film that uh, gave each of us a chance to uh, look at Electrum uh, in a way that uh, very likely we won't be able to in, in real life and uh, give context and uh, depth to the story. And Greg, I'd like to thank you for giving us uh, the insight into uh, your future endeavors and, and, and taking the next step. I'm wondering if we might uh, all sit down at this point and uh, care, uh, continue the conversation. And uh, to start off, I'd like to ask uh, about uh, how you both first uh, got to know one another and how you both uh, got involved in the project. Uh, um, uh, uh, first, let's start with, uh, with you, uh, Greg. Well, I think Alberta showed up at SRL uh, to film part of the SRL performance that was in the yard. And uh, we're all having lots of good fun blowing things up and running machines and fixing machines that were failing. And, uh, uh, afterwards, Alberta and I had a chat about her projects and what she was doing. Greg, can you tell us more about uh, Survival Research Labs, or SRL? Um, you uh -huh. lived there for several years, as I understand, and what the purpose of the group was. Mm -hmm. Survival Research Labs, uh, for those that are not familiar, is a kind of a group of artists and technicians and general technical enthusiasts who um, like to get together and build very unlikely machines and contraptions out of what we call obtainium, that is, things that can be easily obtained. <laughs> and uh, it's a really interesting group. I learned so much about the obtainium markets and how to build some very complex and sophisticated machines out of literally things you can find late at night in abandoned factories. <laughs> And last night you mentioned when we were talking that um, Survival Research Labs likes to build machines that let the technologies do what they actually really want to do. Mm -hmm. Or you uh, like want to talk about that? I think that's Mark's vision, uh, the director of Survival Research, and I kind of agree with it. Uh, we like to read NASA tech briefs and uh, DARPA literature and find out some of these sophisticated drive mechanisms. And you look at them and you say, here's this awesome mechanism but you can see it's clearly bored with what it's tasked to do, and it wants to do something more exciting. So, so um, That's kind of our job, <laughs> help it achieve that goal. So I, I went to San Francisco to um, produce a shoot for a sci-fi channel about survival research labs, and afterwards Greg came up to me and told me that he was working on a project that I might find interesting. And, you know, the biggest, the world's biggest Tesla coil, I just thought that sounded really TV friendly. So I started, uh, I started filming right away. And I'd go up to San Francisco on weekends and, and 
with uh, my friend David Safian, who's a cinematographer, and he, we, sh we filmed all, most of the testing in some of the building. And uh, so when Alan Gibbs asked me to, to make a film about the Electrum sculpture in 2010, he asked me to make Lightning Dreams, and I had all this archival footage with Greg from 98, 97, that um, we were able to use in this film. Looking back, I feel very fortunate that Alberta wanted to do it because she, she knew how to frame the whole problem. And if, if, if she hadn't come along, I, I think the whole project would have just gone undocumented entirely. I had a cheap 640 by 480 camera, and I usually forgot to bring it even <laughs> to, to work. So. Uh, Alan Gibbs uh, seems to be a very, uh, very strong uh, personality. Uh, what was it like, uh, you know, working with him in in uh, in, in building Electrum and also in, in making the film? Well, Alan Gibbs is really quite a guy. <laughs> um, you feel kind of in your lifetime, you may, you know, just to have interactions or to know someone like that is really interesting. Um, he's he's so smart, and um, it's a little daunting actually to work for him. But he's been um, he's very, you know. Creative. I mean, with all of his um, money, he does really fun things. He's he's funding like creativity by working with artists to and in the engineers to build giant things that you know have never been built before. And he's he's just. Um, I think he really likes the the kind of scientific aspect I bring to the films about his sculptures. And um, I've made three, four films for him. So far, so I must be doing something right. But I'm always a little nervous when I have to like deliver the cut to him. <laughs> it sounds like he really uh, pushes people, and that's a very good thing. And that it allows you to you, you uh, go further than you might have perhaps thought that you could at one point. And to that end, w was there a time in building Electrum, and that what was the greatest challenge in it? And uh, and uh, you, you commented very briefly at the beginning of the film that you weren't entirely sure at the at the outset that you'd be able to. Uh, to finish it, and so can you mm. shed some light on what, what some of the pitfalls were or times when you doubted yourself? Pretty much from the beginning onward. <laughs> um, yeah, when I accepted the job, I didn't even have a zeroth order idea of how you do the switching of the primary circuits. Uh, ultimately, the, the primary needs a switch that controls 44,000 volts at 2,800 amps. And it has to switch that 300 times a second. Um, we came up with a, a mechanical rotating gap that's a lot like a distributor in a car. In fact, it's in common use for uh, uh, Tesla coils. Uh, uh, a lot of them use uh, rotary gaps, but usually with armatures about this big. Uh, we used uh, 220 pounds of rotating aluminum on 26-inch armatures. There were four of them. And uh, balancing it was uh, quite a bear. Um, the, the first time I tried to balance it, uh, it, it developed this odd instability that caused the rotor to strike one of the stators. And it took the stator, threw it out of the building, and threw the side of my truck. <laughs> so it's, that was kind of a pause for reflection at that point. <laughs> but eventually I ran into somebody who dealt with rotating machinery and said, oh, okay, well, here's how you balance it and blah, blah, blah. And we finally got it to hold together. <laughs> and Alberta, in making the film, there's uh, uh, just the, the scale of the, uh, of the work and, uh, uh, and the landscape is very, very compelling. Uh, how did you, uh, did you find, what challenges do you find in actually uh, uh, connecting all the dots and then and putting it together in a beaten piece? And you mentioned that in, in delivering the cuts to Alan that you always been a little bit nervous. Um, uh, were, there, were there things that you found particularly challenging and, and, uh, and how did, you, uh, how did you go about uh, um, working those out? Well, you really, um, with making a film in such a giant landscape, you just have to plan ahead and plan your shots and how things are going to go together. So before you start shooting there, you, you've kind of storyboarded or planned out what you're going to be seeing on the screen. Um, and then as far as, I mean, I usually, the, the film is finished when I send it to him, and he's, um, doesn't really he 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 just likes it how it is. He doesn't really give a lot of in he doesn't give any input about the film okay. or what it should be. But um, yeah, very good. In your 
neither of you are stopping. You know, at this point, you, you're continuing on with, uh, with other plans. And uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, lightning on demand. Um, and uh, Greg, you hinted a little bit about uh, the, uh, some of the mysteries uh, of how lightning travels at very, very large distances. Um, and uh, in, in particular, uh, you'd mentioned uh, before that, uh, that this particular size was chosen uh, uh, for the sake that uh, uh, this, these phenomena start to manifest themselves at that, at that scale. Um, uh, can you give some insight into uh, what that breakdown mechanism is? Well, the predominant theory uh, by Gurevich and Zyvon is that if you have an electric field, which is so many volts per unit length, over a certain distance, like say the electric field directly under a storm cloud that's ready to strike, if you get a relativistic electron, that is one going nearly the speed of light to enter that area, it can accelerate in the field. And since it's relativistic, it has a much lower probability of hitting atoms. It can get, build up enough energy that when it finally does hit one, it can generate more of its same kind. And eventually that forms an avalanche. But that avalanche takes some distance, which they calculate it's about 60 meters of open space to form an avalanche and start the lightning strike. Um, this could be one reason why nobody's ever stumbled across this in a laboratory, because nobody's bothered to build a laboratory 60 meters wide that can generate a high electric field over that whole distance. And uh, it, it looks like there's really some stuff there from precursors that the Russians saw and what the Gamma Ray Observatory have seen very recently. I think there's plenty of reason to build the machine, if for no other reason, just to keep me off the street. <laughs> and going back to an earlier question, you'd mentioned how difficult the switches were for uh, Electrum, and it's you know, 135,000 watts. As I understand, with lightning on demand, each of the towers is about two megawatts. And uh, what type of switches are you contemplating using for, for that machine? Well, since Electrum, there's been massive improvements in solid state devices. In fact, when I worked at SLAC, we helped Mitsubishi Heavy Industries develop a transistor, a single transistor about this big, that can switch uh, 4,500 volts at 2,000 amps. And uh, the lighting foundry will use an array of these transistors to switch 40,000 volts at 50,000 amps. Uh, or so the theory goes. <laughs> there, there will probably be a few bugs along the way, but we, we know exactly what kind of fire extinguishers to use on this. Uh, carbon dioxide or a dry chemical? or. <laughs> Carbon dioxide's a good one. Halon's also good if you have an enclosed space. Good, we've got carbon dioxide and halon in the theater of electricity, so we're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alberta, what is, uh, what's next for Ask Labs? Uh, well, Ask Labs has um, a, a film premiere of the film called New Form at the Farm about the Anish Kapoor sculpture at Gibbs Farm. That's gonna be at the RISD Museum uh, January 17th. And, um, another showing of that at the Peabody Essex Museum, February 2nd. Um, and we also have a film entered in the Focus Forward Features Contest, which is a micro-documentary about a group at MIT called the Vehicle Design Summit. And they are building a modular vehicle that gets over 200 miles per gallon, alternative fuel. So, um, and the best way to keep track of what we're doing and know about our screenings is to like us on Facebook, which is um, Ask Labs Documentary Film. Okay. Outstanding. Um, uh, Greg, uh, you mentioned that you're you're looking for uh, you know looking for the materials uh, for you know for the Lightning Foundry, um, and uh, in particular, are uh, are there some uh, hitches or pitch, uh, pitfalls that you're that you're stumbling up against, or or does it uh, look like things are opening up and in terms of uh, in, in terms of supplies? Oh, it's fantastic. There's uh, all kinds of stuff out there on the surplus markets. Uh, a lot of wind power contracts being canceled and things like that, in, in both in Holland and New Jersey. And so arrays of IGBTs are, are showing up. And uh, they're just about the right size. I, ha I have to redesign the coil a little bit to accommodate uh, the parts we find. But uh, that's an ongoing process. Every time we find some really good deal on a piece of plastic or capacitors, we literally have to redesign the machine to accommodate it. But it's it's worth it. It's the only way, really, that I think it's going to get there. And uh, 
you mentioned that uh, you have uh, some guidelines about uh, uh, about your projects. That uh, you have, you know, the principally scientific motivations, but you also have some educational uh, uh, motivations. In that, uh, you hope that when people experience uh, the lightning on demand, that they will be inspired uh, by the phenomenon that they see. Yeah, I mean, I was always inspired just by the pictures I saw from the 1939 World's Fair in New York, and. Uh, I thought it might be a good opportunity if the thing actually did get built to every now and then have some kind of public performance where it's presented in an educational and scientific way and you could actually demonstrate some of the forces at work that electricity can do um, and some of the ways electricity is safe and some of the ways that it's not. For instance, you could have a helicopter hovering between the towers with the blades spinning and have the arcs play on the blades, but it's completely safe. Whereas the arcs could be arcing over here doing nothing, and you have, say, a pool of gasoline with just a little metal spike in it, and the sand almost fire off the spike could set the gasoline off. It would be the non-obvious unsafe version. Of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I, th I think it'd be good for the public at large to have kind of an intuition of how electricity works and when it's safe and when it's not. Very good. Well, I want to tell you both uh, what an extreme privilege and pleasure it is to, to, uh, to be able to, to speak with you both, and, uh, and also invite uh, all the audience members to uh, feel free to ask uh, Greg and uh, Alberta questions um, as we proceed down into the theater of electricity. Uh, we'll be doing uh, a demonstration that's about 20 minutes long, and then we'll have uh, some, uh, uh, a few select people actually get to go inside uh, our uh, Faraday cage uh, as it's uh, struck with a Van de Graaff generator uh, or Tesla coil, your choice. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, interactions. Uh, you'll be able to light up uh, neon tubes, uh, just like we saw in the film, uh, have your hair stand on with a small Van de Graaff generator, and we have some beautiful uh, sculptures uh, where uh, acrylic sheets have been charged, uh, and then when the charge discharges out of the plastic, it leaves behind uh, a lightning-like pattern. Uh, so I uh, uh, want to thank you all again, and uh, please join us in the theater of electricity straight away.